we're going to go for a little walk through the woods, okay? okay? Or we could look at big trees. Look at this tree. It's got to be, you know what that looks like to me? What? A bum. A face? It doesn't look like a face. I think it to me looks sort of like a bum. A bum tree. <laughs> a bum tree. <laughs> sort of like a bum tree. I'm Chris Hadfield. You may know me as the commander of the International Space Station or that guy who played David Bowie's Space Oddity in space. But when I'm not in space, I live here on Earth, just like you. And just like you, I want to keep it beautiful for all the following generations to enjoy. So take a flight with me and some really cool people as we look at Earth's future and how you can change it. This is Elevate Endeavor. Being able to see our Earth from space, it's not just stunning, but for the first time you get a real sense of the vastness of it. But what really surprised me was the intricacy. I could see how individual decisions right across continents would leave marks that you could see from the spaceship. It gave me a real sense of just how connected we all are. And surprisingly, a friend of mine who was in completely different circumstances, she made the same observation. Dr. Jane Goodall, who left England when she was 26 to dive into the unknown world of the wild chimpanzees of Gombe Stream National Park in Tanzania, the work that Dr. Goodall did at Gombe, it changed our understanding of the link between humans and the natural world. And to this day, she travels the world leading conversation and action on sustainability. Dr. Goodall, I've been looking forward to talking to you as long as I've known you existed. And, and so it is such a, a treat for me today. Well, I'm looking forward to talking to you as well. So that makes two of us. So it should be good. <laughs> How did the Africa that you arrived in differ from the imagined Africa that you've been reading about for so many years? The part of Africa that I dreamed about was the forest because of uh, Tarzan. So my, my dreams were to go to Africa and to live with wild animals and to write books about them. I wasn't any thought in my mind of being a scientist because girls didn't dream about that sort of thing back then. And every, everybody laughed at me. How will you possibly get there? Um, you know, it's far away. You don't have money. We had very little money. World War II was raging. It was only my mother who said, well, if you really want to do something like this, then you're going to have to work awfully hard and take advantage of every opportunity. Your, your mother came with you. Your mother's a writer, I, I understand. It must have been unusual to have your mother on a voyage like that. Did she write while she was there with you in, uh, in Tanzania and Kenya? And, and how long did she stay with you? The only reason she came when I went to Gombe was because what's Tanzania today was Tanganyika, was sort of one of the last outposts of the crumbling British Empire. The British authorities absolutely refused to take responsibility for a, a young girl going on her own in the forest. In the end, because Leakey never gave in, they said, oh, all right, but she's got to come with someone. So mum volunteered. And I had money for only six months to start with. I mean, you know, I had no degree and it was amazing. We found a, a wealthy American philanthropist who said okay money for six months and um, she stayed for four of those months she had a little clinic she wasn't a doctor or a nurse and she would the fisherman would come from along the beach she had aspirins and and um, epsom salts and the old-fashioned remedies and because she cared about people she'd spend hours sort of treating tropical ulcers she, she became known as the White Witch Doctor. It would seem to me, I mean, those animals are, are bigger than you or I, uh, especially the large males. In, incredibly strong, the geometry of their arms and such. But have you ever thought about what is the most dangerous thing you've ever done? Yes, I have been dragged and stamped on by very strong chimps, but they weren't out to, to harm me. They were just trying to prove their dominance, which was ridiculous because they must have known, but anyway. And the worst things were when I got myself into stupid situations where I shouldn't have gone anywhere and climbed up a too steep slope and 
you know, I think the worst thing was when I reached up to finally pull myself up onto the ridge from this very steep, slippery slope. And I pulled up on this boulder, um, which is about this big, and it came loose and came down on top of me. And we both rolled. Oh, wow. Thank goodness, something, somebody, something threw me off the trail into the side and the boulder went on without me. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here now. It seems to me historically, life sometimes moves in eureka moments. After three months in Gombe, observing uh, a chimpanzee that you called uh, David Greybeard, after three months, you observed that humans are not the only tool makers in the world, a, a, a boastful, prideful thing that, that we thought separated us from everything else. It actually didn't surprise me that chimps did that because there had been a detailed study of a community of chimps in captivity by a German psychologist. And people pooed what he said. They said, oh, well, his chimps were intelligent and and did things because human behavior rubbed off on them. I mean, Western science, so arrogant, so flipping arrogant. And when you say, you know, we thought that only humans used and made tools, go and ask some pygmy in the African forest. He knows that chimpanzees make tools. To go back to David and his tool using, one, it was just two weeks after mom had left and I was really sad that she wasn't there to share the excitement because uh, Louis Leakey, as I knew, was really excited. And because at that time we were defined as man, the tool maker, and I sent all this stuff to Leakey and he sent his famous telegram. I wish I had it. But he said, we must now redefine man, redefine tool or accept chimpanzees as human. So that. <laughs> was what brought the National Geographic in with money when the six months ran out. And they sent a filmmaker, photographer, Hugo van Lauwek, who became my, my first husband and recorded all, you know, gradually after David lost his fear, he sort of helped the others to lose their fear too. And so once I got their, you know, got them to trust me a bit, then I could see the differences in personality. I could see differences in behavior. And I realized how like us they are in their communication with kissing, embracing, holding hands, patting one another in reassurance. Began to learn about the mothers and their infants and their siblings and the male dominance struggles where the males bristle and stand upright and swagger and shake their fist, just like some human male politicians, honestly. You've been so productive over the years. And just recently, you have a new series that people can share in, in your ideas to this stage of life called The Hope, I think. What gives you hope? OK, let's face it. We're going through very, very dark times right now with this political swing to the far right pandemic that we brought on ourselves by our disrespect of nature and our disrespect of animals. And, you know, in addition to that, the same disrespect of nature has led to climate change. And I don't know if you see that from space. I'm sure you saw the Australian fires and things like that. Yeah, I did. I photographed them, in fact, yes. I mean, we're destroying this planet. It's the only one we have. And this big difference, the biggest difference between us chimps and other animals is the development of our intellect. I mean, just think, you can go up into space. People are learning about galaxies that are hundreds and thousands of light miles away. It's unbelievable what our intellect can do. So how is it that we're destroying our only planet because of this mercenary, uh, greed for more and more stuff, possessions, power, we're ruining it in that way. Main reason for hope is working with youth. Um, secondly, it's this, this brain, we're beginning to come up with solutions, even in our daily lives, how we can leave a lighter footprint. Next, it's the resilience of nature. You can destroy a place, bring an animal to the brink of extinction and give time and help and nature can take over again. And then the indomitable human spirit, the people who tackle what seems impossible. In 1977, you decided to f found the Jane Goodall Institute. 
I assume it was partially with those same objectives in mind. You were thinking at the time, what was it? Was there something that happened? Yes, something happened. Four of my students, I had this little research station, they were kidnapped. They were kidnapped by rebels from just over Lake Tanganyika. So all, all the funding from my research ended. And, but I wasn't about to give up. So some friends of mine said, okay, well, we'll set up an NGO and then, you know, you can give some lectures and raise some money. Oh, and, wow. Yeah, so that's how it was pushed to start it. And so right at the beginning, people said, oh, well, you're setting it up to carry on the research. I said, yes, carry on the research now. But, you know, chimps are in trouble in many places. So I, I want the, the Institute eventually to also um, support conservation. And then education, if you think about the darkness that we're going through, in order to come out the other side, we have to, we have to tackle really four things. One, poverty, extreme poverty. You cut down the last trees, fish the last fish, buy the cheapest junk food that's harmed the environment because you have to survive. And then we've got to do something about our unsustainable lifestyles, um, which is what we each do as individuals. And um, we have to do something about corruption and we have an ever-growing human population. So with 7.2 billion of us now, in some places, natural resources used up faster than nature can replenish them. And they, they're estimating that in 2050, it'll be closer to 10 billion. If we truly want to have a good quality of living for up somewhere nine or 10 billion as a peak population of humans, we, we can't do exactly the same things that we've been doing for the last 10,000 years, specifically since the Industrial Revolution. It just won't extrapolate properly. And uh, Roots and Shoots, as I understand it, you and, uh, and what, a dozen and a half high school students in Dar es Salaam were sitting on a porch and, and just having a conversation. And that uh, sort of similar to this one where you start talking about what really matters and how can our actions perhaps have a positive influence on the world. Um, were you often meeting with with uh, teenage youth at that time, and and do you still have a chance to do that? It was the 30th anniversary of the Gombe research, so I was giving lectures around Tanzania in high schools and middle schools and universities. But these 12 uh, high school students came to see me because they had all these problems, all these different problems about conservation, the shooting of animals in the national park, the illegal dynamiting for fish, which is destroying the coral reef, the homeless children, the bad treatment of stray dogs. Well, they, they all had different things. So I told them to go back to their eight schools and get their friends who felt the same. And we had a big meeting and this Roots and Shoots was born, which we decided from the beginning it will involve projects, for each group will choose a project to help people, one to help animals, one to help the environment, because it's all interrelated, as I learned in the rainforest. And that the young people would choose their own projects so that they go into things, they talk about it, um, and then they roll up their sleeves and take action. It's all about taking action. You have a, a chimpanzee rehabilitation center in the Congo, I think, and, and I'm not sure how to pronounce it, something like Chimponga or Chimpanga. And there's a video of you with, with a chimpanzee that was rehabilitated and getting ready to be released uh, called Wunda. And just your, the, your hands and her hands through the bars. And, oh, in oh, and that picture, yes. And then uh, when she, of her own spontaneity and, and just sense of gratitude uh, just prior to, to wandering away, as you'd hoped, gave you a, a hug. It, it put a lump in my throat that's even there right now, just even visualizing it, the power of sharing that story. If it had just happened privately, it would have been just as powerful for you, but had so much less impact on me and millions of other people. But what did she, what did she see in, in you? And, and what did you see in her? This is, this is what's weird. I mean, to me, I only met her that day. So Rebecca, the veterinarian who runs the show, she's the director, 
um, she saved her life twice. And yet when Wunder comes out of that, that, car that um, cage she's being transported in, although she runs to Rebecca, she just turns her back on Rebecca, who pats her reassuringly. And then, you know, she climbs up on this crate and she looks like past me and then back, you know, this double take sort of thing. And she just comes over and this, it's most unusual for a chimpanzee to embrace you that long as it's a baby. One of the, one of the African caregivers afterwards, he said, how did she know that that lady is responsible for everything? But of course she didn't. But I do have this kind of, I don't know, I, I think it's some kind of telepathic communication with animals sometimes. It's something that colloquially we would call a human moment, but, but in, in fact, it's just a, a moment of, of, share, of shared life. We have a, a young lady who is going to join us. She's in Ottawa today, and her, her name is Jaya. Hi, Dr. Dr. Jane Goodall. So nice meeting you. Lovely meeting you. Thank you. What was your first night in the jungle like? The first time I slept alone up, up in the mountains, because I used to go up there to be near when the chimps woke up in the morning, because they make beds in the tree every night and I had a blanket up there. So I was up there this first night ever up in, the, up in the mountains and I heard a leopard. And I don't know why I was scared of leopards. I didn't really need to be, but I was. And so what did I do? Well, I thought I'm meant to be here. I'm sure that none of the animals are going to hurt me. And so I just pulled the blanket over my head and People say, but you were stupid. Those animals could have hurt you. Well, but they didn't, did they? All these years, not one of them has hurt me. Wasn't so stupid, was I? No. <laughs> the first time you went into space, were you scared? Dr. Jane said something when she was speaking about hearing the leopard that I think is sort of the same experience that an astronaut is, and that is, you hear something or you, you know about something you're not used to, and then you ask yourself, what, what did I do or what do I do next? And when I'm scared, I, it's because I don't know what to do next normally. I haven't, I haven't thought about it. I haven't um, pictured maybe what might happen in my life. And so uh, I try and not to be in a position where, I don't know what to do next, where I, where I have no idea, where I'm completely helpless in the face of my own life. I think it's really important to consider what might happen in the future and think about um, how are you changing who you are. When I was your age, when I was nine, it was the most important thing I could imagine to try and go physically explore the rest of the universe. But I recognized they're not going to let someone who has no idea what they're doing, go do that. I'm going to have to change who I am. And I started working on it when I, when I was turning 10. And, and I worked on it my whole life to try and be someone that they might trust to, to command a spaceship. Were you scared? Did, were, you, were you frightened to come and talk to us on Zoom? Um, I was excited, but a little nervous because what if I mess up or what if I do that or do this? But, but I'm really happy that I'm here and I had this opportunity to talk to you too. Yeah, well, it was lovely talking to you and I'm really happy to meet you, Jaya. And I hope that when this pandemic is over, we shall be able to actually meet because I do come to Ottawa when I come to Canada. So I'll be able to meet you. Wow. I would like to meet you too. Good. Then we'll meet each other and we'll have a nice chimpanzee hug. Okay. And just before we go, perhaps what strikes me the most is um, your sense of grace. Especially during COVID times right now, we, we lack the, the inner calm and peace and perspective um, and ability to, to, to
to deal with what's happening, to actually find that grace within ourselves, to, to deal with the realities of life. And you can almost feel it coming off you in waves, that, that wonderful, um, enviable feeling of grace. And, and for me, it's what I'll take away from our conversation. And, uh, and it's been a joy. Thank you for taking so much out of your time, especially now into the evening in Bournemouth. I look forward to giving you a, a chimpanzee hug when we get a chance after this particular pandemic to, to meet you in person there in Bournemouth. Once Dr. Goodall had lived in the forests of Gombe for a while, she recognized that a forest is a living, breathing puzzle of interdependent lives. And that's Earth. And we are one of the life forms. And our very existence counts on the fact that that system, that, that ecosystem, is going to continue to function properly. And that, of course, gives us some serious problems to solve. But when you step back, and look at this world, like, like as an astronaut, like I've had a chance to, for its incredible deep beauty and toughness and age, it makes me optimistic that we can make positive change, especially when each one of us recognizes we have a personal responsibility to be a good steward of this planet. And that's what this show's all about. Each and every one of you has the power to make a difference. And if you don't know what action to take yet, I'm certain that in one of the episodes, you will find inspiration. And if Dr. Goodall is any sort of indication of the type of guests that we're gonna be learning from, then I'm excited, because this made for a damn fine pilot. Ground control to Major Tom. Lock your Soyuz hatch and put your helmet on. Thanks for watching. Uh, if you like this video, then give it a like and subscribe to the channel. If, on the other hand, you did not like this video, then there's another button you can push. But then I would be very disappointed in you. And you then run the risk of disappointing someone not only on Earth, but in outer space also. And you would not like that, would you? To check out the next episode of Elevate Endeavor, click here. And for some other really cool content, go to elevate.ca. I'll be there.